Welcome to the Stafford Beer Brain of the Firm reading group uh, with a general intellect unit. Uh, this time uh, we are continuing again our read through the final chapter. Uh, and we are picking off, uh, picking up at uh, page 374, 375. So we just finished reading the first point here. Uh, in this series of five comments that derive from a perception of the total model, working in its synchronous cyclic mode. Um, so I think I'll just read over the first point again to refresh us, and then uh, we'll just move on into the second. All right, so... Um, the meta model that generates the naive feedback function necessarily reduces the sum of the structural variety which is generated by all the models that have so far condensed within it. This is simply because the space and time available to the media to communicate the composite meta model cannot be adequate to report in equivalent detail all the alphabets of interna internationally fraught trouble spots at any one time. There must on average be a variety attenuation at this point. In particular instances, the mass media will make a special effort to preserve the variety inherent in the collection of submodels, if only to combat the contention that they dangerously oversimplify the issues. But they face a dilemma of their own. The more the variety of one world situation is deployed to the various publics, the less time and space is available for others. Thus, in the effort to avert the char charge of oversimplification of some issues, the expectation has to be that they will not only have to oversimplify, but actually to polarize others. And this expectation is certainly fulfilled on many occasions. When, for instance, the public finds that its only choice is to decide whether a particular and newly emerged national leader with a revolutionary government in some distant country is good or bad, in scare quotes. And, of course, that its choice has been made for it by the slant of a two-minute presentation. When the naive feedback function impinges on the crisis itself, it changes all the information flowing through the system, but more especially its variety. This will change the character of all the transducers, attenuators, and amplifiers, which must perform their functions in terms of an ever-diminishing power of discrimination. The system will soon be galloping around its loops, its own loops, at an ever-increasing pace, driven on and gaining my momentum by infuriated responses to its very naivete. Here, then, are the dynamics of the polarizing tendency referred to in the previous point. As to the synchronicity of all sub-regulators, it seems to impart a beat resonance to the development of events, and that can, in theory, and for instance in practice when flying a helicopter, shake the system to pieces. All right, so thoughts on this one. So it seems like you're having uh, faster and faster cycles with lower and lower variety, uh, which kind of provide, uh, yeah, like quote unquote polarized results, like a uh, uh, highly, like drastically varying results. Uh, so that oscillation can get out of control. Uh, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, I, I like the um, the thing here with the beat resonance, right? That like, um, so what he's talking about. It, I, if anyone if anyone plays guitar or whatever, um, there's a thing where if two notes are v very almost in tune, like they're almost the same note but not quite, and you play them together. This, this is when an instrument is out of tune, right? It's actually far from being, it, but it's it's close enough but not quite there. You get this kind of like. Rum, 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 kind of pattern that's a beat on top of the notes, and that's because the the two sine wave the two sine waves are very close, but they're, the distance between them then manifests as this this other pattern. So if they're one cent apart, you get like a a one hertz oscillator on top of them, and that's I, I'm not totally sure what beer is getting at here, but it's it's another layer of distortion 
on top of the signals, right? So not only are the, the signals themselves screwed, but the interference pattern between the signals produces an erroneous dissonant signal of its own. Um, that, and it, it gets its own patterns. Now, if you, were to, if you were tuning your instrument and you were to, I don't know, mistake that beat pattern for a note, you'd be way off base, you know? Um, and that maybe that's maybe what it's getting at with like the system eating its own feedback with even less and less ability to discriminate what's going on. Um, perhaps I don't know. It's just a fun little fun little metaphor he's got going. Um, I just recently had a friend uh, who had uh, two um, intake fans on uh, his PC oh, no. case. Uh, that were slightly out of sync <laughs> and they were producing a beat resonance that was turning the entire case into this big humming instrument. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, it's so that, obviously that, that is be... not good for the case. <laughs> it's going to start to uh, wear on all the joints and everything. I think that's what, uh, now that you've said that, I think that's what Beer's probably getting at here, because this is a thing that shows up in engineering as well, where if you have, I don't know, two drive shafts, one going at like 50 revs per second and the, the other going at 50 and a half, you'll get a beat pattern that might in fact shake the machine to pieces. Um, so like it's, it, the, 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 the interference pattern between the two cycles can actually be its own kind of sine wave. Um, that's that's what your fan example is getting closer to, actually, is that, like, the the extra energy that starts to move those pieces around. I mean, with a computer case, it's going to be fairly low amounts of energy, but it'll be there, and it'll it'll wear on them a little tiny bit. Um, but that's, it's definitely a thing that happens in, in engineering. Like, you can have the machine shake itself to bits, or the helicopter that he's, that he's referring to, to there. Right. Um, okay, so let's go to uh, Jake and then Matt. Yeah, I think I don't I don't know why I keep coming to like Twitter with this, coming back to like Twitter or just social media in general, but like that kind of idea of like you know, the system get like like uh just thinking of the inauguration recently, there's that Bernie picture and then suddenly it goes through this this uh cycle of like memes where people make memes about it and then make memes about those and then eventually shakes itself to pieces and people are like, I oh, fuck this this is boring, like we don't need to see any more of these pictures. And suddenly they don't, they stop kind of like appearing. But I, I, so I think it's like kind of interesting the way that, that I guess social media generally like creates these kind of feedback loops that like keep feeding in to itself and have created this like weird, not monster, but monster. I don't know. But, um, I, yeah. So I, and I, so I think, but I think, you know, taking a, a step back, but I think this is, you know, really what he's, talked about of the kind of like you need to inject you need to re-inject variety into the system you can't have it just feedback on itself because it will turn into this thing you need you need you know you can't just um let it because it'll cannibalize itself right until unless you are introducing something else or something that can absorb the variety of it um, which is what the kind of like i think what he says, like the system three is four, system three, four, five, I guess, of like, you know, fr if you're talking about like within the kind of system um, is what it's supposed to help do. I mean, I know system two is the anti oscillatory but I mean, just like in terms of uh, re rethinking the plan, re like reorienting the system or organization to not, to like deal with the next cycle of the crisis, you know, like, oh, this, this thing happens. And rather than just like, you know, rather than continue to operate under the same conditions, you got to re replan because new information has come in. And if you don't, that's where it just shakes itself apart. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously the system we're looking at in this particular example isn't one that has a system three. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, uh... It's quite, quite a bit more uh, decentralized and chaotic than that. Uh, uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was also uh, immediately reminded of, uh, um, you know, how you can kind of watch it 
you know, break apart in real time, basically on social media, like especially Twitter. And, you know, it, it, it's such an accelerator for, 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 for this that it, it's, it's kind of morbidly fascinating to watch it because like, uh, um, you know, you'll, you'll see like little subcultures fragmenting. And, you know, they'll, they'll be saying things where, like, not only do you have to know about that subculture, you have to know about, like, the subcultures that it's in hostile contact with, and you have to know exactly what bits of information jump ship. So, like, you know, you, you'll see people, you know, uh, who, you know, maybe even kind of kn know their joke lexicon at this point, but, like, you know, they'll say stuff that makes no sense at face value. And then you realize there's there's like five la layers of like, a, a, you know, they're making fun of a catchphrase that the other side started deploying that, you know, like they started, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, turning into an in-joke themselves. So like, uh, you know, you, you'll, you'll, you'll see leftists on Twitter, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, m m make fun of like something that was apparently like some like, you know, like a, a op-ed headline, you know, from some crazy shit lib. And then like, like, like it makes no sense unless you go five layers deep. And I, I think that's kind of what uh, it, it breaking apart actually looks like, because, you know, while, you know, you have these little, you have these little rabbit holes of, uh, um, you know, of mean, uh, of, of meaning, but like, it's totally fragmented. Like, I mean, you know, so, someone who's not totally plugged into that, you know, it means nothing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, for sure. For sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing to consider maybe down the line is like how, this polarization operates like within subcultures in the context of a larger culture because I guess like in the case that we're talking about here we're talking much more about sort of like an international media system as opposed to something which is so uh, nested uh, and dense uh, like Twitter um, okay so let's move on. Um, the cybernetic regulatory system, as described, runs primarily on the analysis of options as recognized within and elucidated by regulatory models that do not display requisite variety. Insofar as this process is fed by inspired leakages from the supposed seats of power, this apparently journalistic activity could be regarded as a form of decision or action on the part of a government itself. It is noteworthy that what would strictly be a political decision, they shall not pass, or a political action, send a gunboat, is frequently avoided by its simulation through the low variety models of these regulatory loops. In itself, this has a cathartic effect. But the situation that is depicted in these quasi-imaginary terms stands to break down, because the regulator does not contain an adequate model of that which it seeks to regulate. This circumstance would appear to increase the likelihood of both covert action, which, so long as it remains covert, is not susceptible to this system of naive filtration, and of surprise action, namely that action which the system did not envisage and cannot therefore handle. Covert action by the United States throughout the Chilean story, which has been freely admitted by now and documented, is an example of the former. The Entebbe raid by Israel on Uganda is an outstanding example of the latter. So, uh... We have first the point that, um, of course, leaks, quote unquote, are often, uh, you know, sort of deliberate uh, on the part of governments uh, and, or other political actors. Um, and then we have the idea that... Um, in order to not... Uh, suffer the potential consequences of taking political action, uh, just sort of floating the idea of taking the action in the media, uh, is, is used as a kind of simulatory process. Uh, but the problem there is that, uh, the simulation machine is more complex than 
the actor that is coding for it. So, like, it tends to get out of hand. Uh, and therefore we have this, like, alternative mode of action, uh, which is to either keep things out of the media entirely because of that possible runaway effect, or to uh, sidestep the uh, simulation entirely and sort of like the collective model of reality that it represents by just taking surprise action out of the blue. Um, yeah. So let's go to Shane. So the, 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 the term simulation there makes me think System 4, right? And it makes me wonder if what beers may be getting at is that the media in this case is a kind of um, outboard brain that the government is using to feel out possible futures for itself. A very degenerated form of like the simulation that you would ask of a system for, right? Where you're supposed to simulate your futures, and by making like these little leaks and stuff, and then the the reaction is is bad or whatever. They're they're kind of like feeling it out, and it's it's an extremely degenerated form of a system for, um, and it. It, it, that, that feels right, especially like with um, the COVID stuff that's been going on here, where it seems like government policy on things like schools opening and stuff, and well, fucking everything basically, is oscillating wildly because in one day they'll say, oh, we're going to open the schools tomorrow, and then the next day they're like, no, we're going to shut them and stuff like that. And it's, it's almost like they're, yeah, that like the media frenzy, like fucking fish tank that's tearing itself to shreds is the sort of bizarre slime mold brain of of government like the midbrain like simulating possible futures and simulating reactions to actions and that and that they're they're then responding to that as like that, that's why it looks incoherent it's because it's what a brain does of like doing these multiple overlapping simulations um that then converge on on actual action i don't know am, am i way off on that no i think that makes a lot of sense like you look at uh, sort of like the history of politics in the UK, um, where in the 80s, Labour uh, decides that the reason they're losing is because they aren't able to control the media narrative. Mm -hmm. um, right? And... Yeah. Then under Blair, you have this incredibly media control focused um, style of governance, mm -hmm. which sort of like infects the entire ruling class until mm -hmm. it just becomes this sort of like, I don't know, like appendage of <laughs> the like. <laughs> the the libidinal id of the media <laughs> like just, right. yeah when you well, get people like boris johnson it's just like it's like yeah like you're kind of steering the ship but well yeah it's just sort right. of like in a weird relationship with uh the 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 the, the gut reactions of uh, the media sphere yeah. So, like, if if System Four is like something like an imagination, right? It's like either conscious or unconscious, right? There's there's a sense in which your brain simulate like if you it's like oh I should run and get that boss. Your brain will simulate what might happen if you try to run for the boss now, and then mm -hmm. you might then come up with overlapping kind of outcomes like well I could run and not catch it, in which case it was a waste of time, or there's ice on the ground, so I probably shouldn't run, or maybe it is close enough that I could catch it, and so on. Or maybe I still don't want to do that because I look, look like a fool, and, and so on. So there's those kind of overlapping predictions and imaginings of what a future could be. Um, and that's kind of what the media is, is that that's the role of the like interface between governance and media in this kind of case, right? Like that the, the, the government will, will test run a possible mm -hmm. action by putting it out to the media, seeing what blows up and what doesn't. Um, and then roll with this, or like that, like they get a signal back from the imagination that says, no, 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 that's going to be, that's going to do such and such thing. And so, I don't know. Like, and again, in what we have is an extremely degenerated form of a system four, but it seems to actually be there. Uh, and it's maybe one of its problems is it's running synchronously in real time, because the the kind of system four imagination stuff that the ear wants us to do is parallel 
and uh, non-real time. It's 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 you know you you run multiple parallel simulations before the fact. Now the problem here is that the system four elements are embedded in the material loop itself, and are just synchronous with the loop. Uh, so you don't really get an imagination, but it's something that stands in the place. It, it stands in the place of what the system four would probably be. I don't know. But there's, there's something eerie about this. Well, and this is like into poetry art, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the solution is to is 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 in Baudrillard because he's never interested in solutions. It's probably, it's probably a description uh, of the problem that's more than a paragraph that we get from beer. But hey, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think like the thing is that um, that gets us back into the strategies that beer brings up here, right? In terms of like either doing it covertly or by surprise. So, like, if you want to run your system four as, like, a network system that deals with all your system ones, um, then you have to run that, like, in a sort of, like, media isolation bubble unless you want it to just be get, uh, you just want it to be drawn into the uh, synchronous variety reducing cycle that Beer is describing here. Um, so that's a real problem, right? Uh, maintaining that separation. Uh, okay, so let's go to Jeremy. So there's a group of ways back called the Church of the Subgenius. And uh, great parody religion stuff. But they actually did some politics too. And one of the things they did in their political wing was to say... Talking about the U.S. government, did the U.S. government, in their like conspiracy theory parody, is entirely set up so that you blame it rather than the people in power. That all of the trappings, the president, the Congress, the Supreme Court, all the state reps, everything, are basically performing a theater so that you get outraged by the kayfabe going on with these actors when actually what's really happening is the conspiracy, which to them is like the amalgamate, basically it's the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, like is actually running the show. And so I see some of this in, in beers, in this idea that like there's, you know, the media is constantly propping up who you should give a shit about. And Especially, like, I don't even consume a lot of celebrity media because it just fills me with existential horror. I don't know who any of these people are and I don't care. But even in the politics part, you know, people, you know, the media wants you to get really excited about Mayor Pete, you know? And I don't give a shit about Mayor Pete. I, I, I don't care. He's, he's not relevant to my life in any way. You know, maybe if I had to get a grant from the transportation department, he would become relevant. But, you know, there's a lot of this sort of kayfabe where the media, you know, it's, it's, the media wants you to play chess with its pieces. Even if the actual chess game is going on on a different board that you can't, that's not immediately in front of you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, like, uh, I, I, I feel like, uh, um, you know, like, see, like media trial balloons as like, you know, like a feedback loop with like a lot of uh, um, uh, um, decision making power in terms of like public opinion. Like that's almost giving it too much credit. Like, you know, like, there, like, that's certainly an element to it, but I think that also even, you know, uh, that, that maybe even has more to do with, like, how, like, a, a leaked possibility will affect um, the stock market, which, you know, I mean, like, 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 that's probably more, like, like, the feedback loop there than, like, a public opinion poll about, you know, a leaked plan. But, yeah, I mean, cause it's also a distraction, you know, I mean, it's also that, okay, yeah, yeah, th th this, th 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 these are the things that, 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 that are going on, you know, I mean, this is what should be on your radar, and for the most part, it'll be stuff that, you know, can, Kinda like deeply doesn't matter. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um yeah, uh definitely uh as Rudy said in the chat here, there's a lot of 
COVID restrictions where they like floated in the media, see the reaction, and then decide if they'll actually go ahead with it or do something different. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, well, let's continue down this road. Um, so... When because of the entropic drift that steadily erodes variety in this crisis regulator, polarization is eventually induced because no more than two states of the system can now be discriminated, it may be recognized by agonizing displays of insincerity. These arise because the induced dichotomy is spurious. The rights of neither pole can be discussed rationally, and therefore become the subject of quote-unquote moral stance and outpourings of sanctimonious quote-unquote ethical dicta. This is not to argue that there can be no such thing as a genuine ethical position. There can. But if ethical stands, which appear to be based on value judgments, are in fact generated merely by differences in the premises of the models that have been inadequately constructed, and meretriculously pervade, then this would explain their apparent insincerity, in that politicians palpably adopt inconsistent ethical standards from one world crisis to the next. This has recently become a scandal of such proportions that, I suggest, no morality will sustain its credibility for much longer. Well, wasn't that prophetic? Uh, what then will become of the motivation to warfare? It would be naive indeed to answer peace. Um, okay. Uh, finally, there is one very simple consequence, aside from war itself, of the systematic loss of systemic variety as the process uh, depicted in figure 50 unfolds. The crisis generates possibilities within the world situation of such complexity that they cannot even be expressed within the model structures made available. Thus, all possible solutions to the problem are rendered unacceptable to at least one faction. This is, I think, outstandingly true of the apparently endless war of attrition in Northern Ireland. And it has to be conceded that the same point could be made about Allende's problem in unifying his own coalition. Great comments on these two points. Uh, Shane, go ahead. It, an example that just popped into my head was, um, I'm not sure which Adam Curtis documentary this is in, but it's where um, the media are covering, like the BBC are covering some conflict in, in Africa, and they have this general sort of framework for reporting where there's the, um, there's the evil aggressors and then there's the good guys or whatever in, in any of these kind of conflicts. They have a very straightforward kind of model to present on the media. And then they get into this situation where on camera they're, you know, doing their, their broadcast bit and they're, they're at a refugee camp. And behind them, like, the refugees are hacking each other to bits, which completely scrambles the narrative. And now they don't know how to put, how to make it make sense on the news because the, these are supposed to be the good guys, you know? And this is, and then, the, you know, because of course the, the actual conflict is multifaceted and various, but the coverage, the, the framework for coverage couldn't possibly be. And then when this happened, they, I think they just stopped, kind of stopped covering this and stopped talking about it. So it's just that they, they won't even, like it can't even be processed in this like synthetic imaginary that we we're all kind of trapped in. Um, and things that, things that can't, like the, the actual complexity of the world can't be processed in those terms. And so it gets dropped. Um, I mean, the same thing happens to all kinds of institutions that are in free fall. And it's just like, oh, here's an inconvenient fact. Well, what fact? <laughs> you know? Uh, I, I didn't see anything. Yeah, I mean, I guess listening to, like, Radio Warner cover all these, like, conflicts that don't get covered very much in the world, um, you get the sense that there's some kind of, like, procedure for deciding how to cover these wars, which is uh -huh. like, first of all, are they our ally? Like, are our allies involved? Uh, if yes, can we somehow provide, uh, portray them in a positive light? Uh, if no, uh, let's not report on the war. 
uh, if yes, then we'll report on the war and make it about the good side versus the bad side. And then there's, like, some edge cases, right, where it's, like, more about, like, oh, we'll just focus on the bad of the other side or whatever. But it, it feels like there you could, like, work out, like, a decision tree for how the media decides to cover foreign wars uh, based on just, like, yeah, very basic principles of uh, self-interest and uh, availability of, of uh, props for their drama that they're putting on. Um, all right, uh, let's go to Matt and then Jake. Yeah, and, and I mean, like, uh, the, the, you know, the details here, I, I, I think, are uh, uh, useful. But, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, polarization in general is one of those things that, that I think is, um, you know, something that people talk about, like, a little bit more than is warranted by its importance. Because, like, on a lot of, like, the really fundamental issues, like, most people are actually very consistent. You know, I mean, stuff like, uh, um, you know, um, uh, um, uh, uh, like, like, um, you know, um, Med Medicare and Medicaid being able to negotiate drug prices, which they can't right now. And, you know, like a, a lot of like distribution, uh, um, you know, economic distribution stuff. Th this is like super majority, you know, more than two thirds of the country supports it. But, you know, like uh, we act like it's 50 50 because really it's, you know, it's sectors of capital that, you know, have like slightly different interests and where, you know, for, for, for some of them, it actually is beneficial for, for, for them to have like some more social services. And, uh, you know, because, the, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the bourgeoisie have a disproportionate say and, you know, a lot of these things really are just factional fights between them, you know, things look a little bit more um, uh, um, fractured than they really are. When, when reality, you know, like, it's really just the fact that most people have no meaningful, you know, access to the control switch at all. And so what they want is irrelevant. You know, the polarization actually isn't like the, the, the deciding factor there. It's mostly just the fact that they don't have a control, they, they don't have a working, um, a, a steering wheel in the first place. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good point. Um, definitely. I think the polarization, uh, where you have people just sort of, declaring very loudly for causes that they don't believe in um, is a feature of uh, certainly American politics but um, it's important to also consider as you said like well who gets to add to that conversation or set the terms of what the polarity is um because yeah you, you these these positions that are held are just like yeah varieties of the bourgeois position uh matt go ahead yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I, you know, I, I think it's part of why, you know, like, like the Berean, you know, like Cybersyn, you know, style of like incorporating digital democracy um, uh, uh, channels. Like, I think that's part of why it's so important, because, I mean, you know, lo like, like the stuff that's enshrined in our in, you know, like law and tradition are stuff for governing in 18th century landholders republic in the U.S. You know? yeah. <laughs> and things like other parts of the government, you know, I mean, uh uh, work on much faster routes, and so l l like uh, like the channel capacity actually is just isn't even high enough uh, here because you know like giving yeah the, the universal suffrage was really something that was only ever allowed you know grudgingly and you know <laughs> they, they, they've kind of always regretted it and you know have been kind of trying to push back on it as much as possible l l like uh, that's, that's why you really need you know the, the you know uh, technology to to enable like mass participation on you know on, on multiple time scales and then multiple decision scales. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, let's go to Jeremy and then to Jake. Uh, so two points. One about the fourth bullet and one about the fifth. Uh, um, on the fourth bullet point, like there's an American congressman, uh, Matt Getz, who basically is a rich, drunken frat boy turned congressman. He's a conservative Republican. His dad probably owned the car dealership in his town and got him what he wanted. He's had like six DUIs and now stands up and beats his breast about morality. Um, but 
there was he's in a committee and the committee's ground to a standstill because he wants to demand that every session open with them all standing and saying the Pledge of Allegiance. And it has nothing to do with the committee he's involved in. And he's ground everything to a halt, demanding that everyone say the Pledge of Allegiance and having a vote about it. And everyone else is like, look, we have business to attend to. Shut the fuck up. And But American Republicans have a tendency to do this where they'll just take an issue and, be, and turn it into a binary. You know, you have to say the Pledge of Allegiance before you can have a meeting because that's the patriotic thing to do. And if you don't do it, you're showing yourself off as unpatriotic. When that's fucking stupid and has nothing to do with anything, you know? It's not even patriotism, it's just ridiculous performative bullshit. But the Republicans love that kind of thing, where they're like, we're going to make a wedge issue out of absolutely nothing because we know our people will amplify it on talk radio and be incredibly outraged over it, even though it's completely un inconsequential. It's a cheap, easy victory. And the other is, I remember... Um, I guess I was in undergraduate when Hastings Banda died, who was a dictator of Malawi, and longest longest serving Afri post colonial African leader. And I was listening to the BBC at the time, which you had to get on shortwave radio, and they did a whole hour on the legacy of Banda and his role in the Cold War and anti colonial and anti communist struggles and all this stuff. And just out of curiosity, I looked in American media, and nobody even reported that it happened. And I was wondering about that, and I was realizing it was my first realization that Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, just is not mentioned at all in the U.S. media. And it's because they're terrified that their viewers, their listeners, don't want to look at a map and look at a country on a map that they don't already know. And so spending an hour talking about the dictator of Malawi, who is the leader for 27 years and shaped a lot of sub-Saharan pol African politics, is telling the listener that they're ignorant because they don't know this. And that this would be received incredibly poorly and would cause pain to the viewer. So rather than inform the viewer, they just don't even mention it. You know, this whole idea that this crisis in Malawi, which was a real crisis because there was one party rule and it collapsed afterwards and all this stuff, was never even expressed because talking about Malawi was inexpressible in the meta language of American media. It just was absolutely inexpressible. You couldn't even say anything because it would cause a crisis in that brain of the listener, according to the media censorship of the time. And we deal with a lot of that, I think, in a lot of different media, where you cannot bring up something that's going to prove that the listener has no idea about something. They, they need to be flattered. They don't need to be challenged. Yeah, well, I think this... I mean, first of all, that's why there's the PBS nightly news, right, in the U.S., is so that people in Washington can listen to it or watch it or whatever. Um, it's very, very, uh, very clubby, very, uh, uh, you know, very inside baseball for those folks. Um, uh, but the second thing I think is that it's also that the BBC is actually listened to in Africa itself. <laughs> and so it's like, because of the colonial legacy there, um, the BBC is very much a part of that conversation uh, and is seeking to control it. Uh, whereas the American media, like, they just don't really have that same kind of arrangement. Um, yeah. So, uh, it's, yeah, it's an interesting combination of, like, the colonial legacy making it a matter of concern for the people of the, like, imperial country or post-imperial country, but then also 
like engaging it in the post colonies themselves. Uh, so it kind of goes both ways. Uh, anyway, um, let's go to Jake. Yeah, I think that was very interesting. I think I don't know. It's you know, I it's interesting to think about like the the sort of we have been in crisis for so long in this, like, in the U.S. and the world, you know, in the Western world generally, that, like, the sort of polarization has reached such a level where, for some segment of the population that they've kind of captured in especially, like, traditional media circles, like with, like, right-wing pop radio and Fox News and stuff, to where they have all of these, like, particular shibboleths and, and like, code not not code words, but like basically code words that they can use to sort of like re-engage their audience. And, you know, like even tr- even newer right wing media like uh, YouTube uh, people uh, use the same kind of thing, you know, where it's like they've got the sort of dog whistles and they've got these like uh, ideas and like common sense things that they can kind of apply in, you know, not in context if you're or like it's somewhat out of context if you're like knowledgeable about the subject, but if you only know the kind of like surface level stuff that you would know from like listening to these things or watching these things, then then it like reinforces it's it's a positive feedback for their like ideology, um, and it's become so so I don't I don't, I, I don't want to say like broadly disconnected from the world as as it exists, but 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 it is that you know like just. The, not trying to be like super uncharitable, but at the same time they're very uncharitable. So, kind of got to give it to them or or not give it to them. But um, so it's very interesting and and yeah, especially like this bit about the like the politicians just adopting ethical standards that are inconsistent and people have become so jaded and cynical to it. It's like this is why we're at this point where four hundred thousand people have died in the U.S. of COVID and no one gives a shit because it's become so abstracted and so like. Well, what is, you know, ethics, like, what is it? And then to the, to the people that, that still have some semblance or, or, uh, provide lip service to it, they're just, they, they just say, oh, well, it's just not even real. It's just not happening. It just isn't, you know, they're, they're so outside of their framework. They've become so polarized against the potential that, like, the government, and not the government, but, like, society, you know, at writ large could, could fail the, uh, to, to to protect people's lives in such a massive extent that it just they, they just don't think it, it's real. And then I would also I would also say that like the right has very effectively polarized people against the concept of government to the fact to the to the effect that they're able to blame so much of what happens just on government when of course in reality it's it's always been a, a, a merging of government and business in a in a sense you know not in the like fascist sense traditionally you know but like in the technical sense of like these government and corporation like government and corporate people are often the same people and they communicate very frequently and they plan things out in a way um but then of course they're just using that to like say like well any government is that government itself can never solve the problem because it's inextricably linked to this um and then yeah i think that last bit the last point of the like that as the crisis unfolds is just like impossible to actually express it within the channel so it's just so that some people get kind of like pushed out of it out of those channels and i would i would say i don't know i don't know if this is like part of why there's been so much like left splitting you know if it if it's reduced if it can be reduced to that or if it's i mean obviously it can't be reduced to that but like you know if that's a sort of main component of that kind of thing or if it's something else but but I would say it's definitely like a thing to grapple with and consider like, you know, what are the ways in which, again, like systemic variety can be re-injected into the system um, in a way that doesn't, that prevents people from kind of being shut out because I guess, I guess, uh, you know, just sort of talking over and thinking about it more, like when people like feel their voices aren't being heard in like an organization, you know, that their input isn't it isn't useful or considered useful or uh, there's no place for it, you know, then that's when 
that kind of thing can happen. And I guess you could consider that a systemic loss of variety in a sense. So, so maybe the the solution is just to like consistently allow people to sort of inject their their variety through their own point of view into like internal and external facing like aspects of the organization, um, or maybe just more internal, I guess, because it's about internal cohesiveness and not as much about external like perception of the organization but um yeah i don't know just like thinking about like in my own organization of like recent uh you know like people just sort of talking on discord or whatever leads to kind of like so you know people talking past each other right and the solution to that being to kind of like inject some kind of um not like slowing down of the communication but like trying to get people to write more long form articles detailing their positions rather than like just making smaller comments, but then also trying to like systematize the way of doing that to not put the burden of effort onto the people making the like sometimes offhand, sometimes uh, useful and, and insightful comments and like compiling those into a document, a longer document that can be disseminated. Um, so as to like sum up those ideas, but not, you know, not in a way that, again, it's just like collecting that kind of like variety that's been injected, maybe more care, like somewhat carelessly, but still like representative of, of the variety that exists within the system, uh, just into a way that's like more processable, right, by the people who aren't able to keep up with like the fast paced variety that, or not variety, but the fast pacedness of like online discussion forums kind of thing. Yeah, I'm sure something like that must be necessary. Um, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, you, you definitely see that where it's like, yeah, you'll have a discussion, um, it'll get polarized, uh, people will become more and more partisan, and then there's like a bunch of people who are just like, I don't see my opinion reflected in this at all, and I'm not even going to engage. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, let's move on just a little bit more and then we'll wrap things up here. Um, these comments complete the present account of the cybernetics of crisis. The whole exposition of this model has been put forward under four headings, which were introduced many pages ago as four major cybernetic requirements of homeostatic stability. To recapitulate, one, the system is obedient to Ashby's law of requisite variety. Two, information channels maintain variety entrusted to them. Three, transducers neither attenuate nor amplify variety. And four, uh, the time cycle is synchronous for all subsystems. Yeah, the time cycle is synchronous for all subsystems. The extent to which a self-organizing system recognizes these requirements, seeks to obey them, flouts them by accident or design, and finally achieves its comeuppance at their instigation, will indeed determine that system's viability. The outlook by these tokens for crisis regulation must be adjudged bleak. These four requirements were drawn respectively from the four principles of organization enunciated in this book's companion volume, The Heart of, the Enter uh, the Heart of Enterprise. They are exemplifications of those general principles. The model offered here, however, is merely a start in elaborating the cybernetics of crisis. In working on it, a haunting question has been in the forefront of my vision. It is an important question, and one attending all utterances that could be labeled managerial cybernetics. If it is naive to reduce the variety of real-life crises by employing attenuators of the kind described, which, for example, include the use of pungent variety destroyers such as sarcasm and dramatic irony, then is it not also naive, and indeed equivalently dangerous, to propose relatively simple models of crisis regulation? using, on recent occasions, somewhat similar expository tricks. I wish precisely to restate two fundamental tenets of any science, of which cybernetics is an example, that all natural processes exhibit formal invariances, 
and that the corpus of scientific knowledge is composed of statements which not only state but suitably constrain such invariant relations within the compass of their applicability. In this book, then in seeking to disclose a model of any viable system, and in this section of the book, then in seeking to disclose a model of societary crisis, vast amounts of variety have been discarded. This has sometimes been done explicitly, as for example by dismissing it in sarcasm or dramatic irony. But usually it has been done implicitly, by privately selecting what should be included in and what should be excluded from the developing models. If mistakes have been made, the models can be tested to destruction. They seem to me to be useful, but they are cheerfully submitted to the Popperian criteria of disproof. This is not true of the variety reduction engaged in by crisis manipulators themselves. They are not seeking invariances. If I went on to say that they are seeking, it could be called an expository trick. But they themselves neither doubt nor deny the pragmatic values to which they answer, and on behalf of which variety is justifiably axed to the bone. Perhaps this statement will dismiss Bonquo's ghost, the specter of less than requisite variety from the cybernetic feast. I hope so. Uh, but I shall t end this section on the cybernetics of crisis with a reference to another specter and another feast. Soon after the beginning of the work in Chile in 1971, and I think that the date was in January 1972, the Chilean government formally applied to the British government for financial aid under an existing scheme in, or in support of all that we were intending to do. This was not my application, and I even refused to endorse it. I had traveled 8,000 miles to work independently of my familiar friends in England, the can't be dunners of those days. This I explained in Santiago, but I did not try actually to veto this alarming proposal. Considerable hard currency sums were due to be spent in England, after all, in projects, salaries, and equipment. The Chilean request must have been duly processed because I eventually found myself, having, or found myself having lunch in London with an officer of the Department of Overseas Aid. He wanted to know how things were going, and I told him how they had gone. The work had been on course. Unfortunately, exactly ten days earlier, there had been an armed insurrection. President Allende, thousands of his friends, and some of mine had been killed. Every life and every freedom was at risk. <clears throat> the long-cherished tradition of democracy and constitutional government in Chile had been brought to an abrupt halt. The project, after two dramatic years, was over. The gentleman, asked, actu sorry, the gentleman actually asked why. We have been discussing naivety. We could map this incident onto the model. Who was naive? Was it the Chilean government who asked for support two years too soon? Was it the British government, who could not understand what the support was for until two, ten days too late? Was it the government of the United States, who funded the coup d'etat? Or was it I, who paid for the lunch? All right, uh, let's go to Matt. Yeah, um, a lot of, like, you know... Um, 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 motive stuff in there, but actually the, the thing that jumped out at me the most was um, him specifying um, synchronous governance of all the subsystems because, like, I, I think that's one area where there's actually been some, like, um, uh, technical advances that, you know, might actually make that kind of either, you know, easier or just not even the right question anymore. So, you know, like, there's been a lot of advance in, like, distributed system stuff. Like, I think this was written in, like, a, or, you know, the second edition was in, like, the early 80s. Um, Paxos, which is, like, you know, like, the, like, heavy hitter is my understanding. Um, uh, uh, you know, like, that, that, that was um, 1988 or 89. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, change, you know re relaxing or changing, you know, specification of the synchronicity requirement. I think, you know, like, uh, th th that makes you actually kind of optimistic because, like, yeah, people are actually um, uh, um, experimenting with ways to do distributed decision making that don't require that kind of hard synchronicity, which actually probably is impossible to do with, like, a very large um, uh, um, population. I mean, you know, the, 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 you know the, 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 like, the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie is, like, a thing, you know, I think partially because of information flow, like, like problems. Like, it was impossible to have, like, real democracy. 
um, uh, uh, at, uh, you know, b before a certain point. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, like, uh, um, you know, between, like, um, com existing, like, technical infrastructure plus uh, um, algorithmic understandings, you know, I mean, you know, we might actually, like, have, like, a way to do this. Right. Uh, well, that's a very interesting point. I mean, I suppose, ultimately, all subsystems of the system are, are synchronous, but it's, you know, there's a lot of... Like, there is a, the, a synchronization of, of asynchronous systems, right, at, at some point. Uh, but the ability to do asynchronous work... Uh, is it quite interesting? Is that is that correct, Matt, or is there uh, actually uh, something fundamentally different about these systems? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so it actually is kind of like well, I, I, I guess it also depends on uh, the way in which uh, uh, be, be, beer means it. But I mean, um, uh, um, um, Paxos is about like moving things to what he calls like logical clocks, where like um, uh, stuff can happen out of sync. But I mean, you know, you can, yeah, like I guess it, it sort of eventually becomes synchronous in a way, but. Um, Actually, I'm not even sure if if, if that if, if if that's the right word, but it, but it's um they'll stay you know co coordinated is maybe a better right <laughs> maybe a better sure word. sure uh, Shane, go ahead. I think maybe what Matt is trying to get at is that like in um, computer science and like especially in database systems or like distributed systems, uh, we have now have these concepts of like uh, distributed consensus and like eventual consistency mm -hmm. um, and yeah. systems that are able to. Like, say, a distributed database that has uh, any number of nodes, so long as it's odd, will be able to coordinate the nodes so long as they can, like, reach each other. They can, like, kind of elect a leader, but without ever referring to a central, like, coordinating authority. Yes. So, like, it, it, it kind of removes the need for, like, oh, no, there's, there's, the, there's the master server, and then there's all the, the other ones. That um, a distributed mesh of nodes can actually come to coherence without necessarily and it can do it asynchronously but i think you're you're right kyle that like what what's happening is it's eventually eventually consistent not like not necessarily synchronous but eventually consistent right 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 that makes sense yeah. yes it's a kind of deferred consistency where for a moment you might get an inconsistent snapshot of state across the the services but they will converge on the truth so that if you like i don't know you update your shopping cart or whatever for a microsecond like there will be an inconsistent state of your cache, but like after uh, a few microseconds it'll all kind of shift into place. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, Jake, let's uh, go to Jake. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. I I um yeah, this is, it's all very like you know, kind of hands this little point with a very kind of poetic thing of like, well, you know, if things had turned out differently, maybe things would be different, <laughs> you know, which is like, yeah, which is true. Um, but also, you know, is I think, I can't remember what I was, was going to say when I raised my hand initially, but, um, yeah, I, the, the, the bit where, you know, we talked about these two fundamentals of science. Um, you know, as I think, an like, he's kind of important where he's he's identifying that, you know, like, people aren't usually actually trying to, like, find some kind of true, like, true way of, of doing this most effectively. Like, they're not, they may say they're trying to find, like, oh, we want to do this in accordance with, like, democracy and, and whatever, especially when it comes from, like, capitalist institutions or whatever. We want to do this with people's, you know, protecting the, all the corporate speak, you know, but then it, like, the outcomes are not that, and it's because really what they want is just, like, they have a kind of idea of what, of how things should be going, and they chop off the things that don't comport, compart with that, like, uh, that don't fit with that, you know? Um, and they, they just call it, like, truth-seeking or whatever because it's convenient uh, to use that language. But in reality, you know, it's not. Uh, it's not about that. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, it's like... Okay, so... 
This is not true of the variety reduction engaged in by crisis manipulators themselves. They are not seeking invariances. Uh, so, you know, they they are bound to pragmatic values. Uh, yeah, that they, they're, they're just seeking... Uh, they're just seeking uh, positional advantages. It, I mean, it's like the uh, like the GameStop thing, you know, with like the people who are like most like who are gunning up the like redditors and everything, like who actually had some pre-existing stake in GameStop, in GameStop stock, you know, like, and so they were just manipulating the crisis in a in a sense to to gain profit, you know, they weren't actually interested in like fucking over the banks or the, the hedge funds or whatever, even though they said that, and maybe they could still laugh along with everyone else when some hedge fund went bankrupt or whatever, but like their, 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 uh, their goal was, was to use the crisis for their own end in a sense. And then of course, you know, when you take a step back, like, I think another part of this is like, you know, something that beer emphasized a lot of like, what, what is the system in focus that you're looking at? You know, like what level of recursion are you looking at here? Because, if you look at the sort of level of like again to the, the GameStop thing, if you're looking at the level of like individual traders and like people all participating in this thing, then you might think, well, these people are going to lose. They're losing by us doing this thing. But then you sort of take the the look at the broader system that it's within, and you realize, yeah, of course they're going to just change the rules and like lie and cheat. Like they're going to just shut their shut. They'll shut down trading, or they'll get a bunch of money just from the government for no reason, you know, or not for no reason, but you know, for 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 nothing. Um, because it's part of this larger system which requires these people to not go out of business to remain coherent, you know, uh, in a sense, like, make sure the market doesn't just full-on collapse. And I don't think necessarily that, that stop, you know, I don't know the details uh, more than uh, most people, I would say. But, like, you know, this this sort of sy- the system needs to re- remain coherent. It needs to remain, like, people people who are the ones manipulating the crisis or the ones that are like uh, able to act within the crisis because they've got a huge amount of money to move around and power to do it are going to do what they need to do to maintain the like systemic organization, like the systemic coherence. And what, and if that means cutting off some people at the bottom who have like hundred dollars invested in stocks, like so be it, you know, they'll just cut them off and it's, and it's fine because it doesn't really matter. And people get mad about it because they, they have this notion that like, well, things work this way, uh, that, you know, the market is free or some bullshit, you know, but it's like, you know, just a- any uh, understanding of the facts, and certainly from this perspective, like, reveals how, like, hollow that is, you know? Right. Uh, Shane, go ahead. So I think the, the important context for those couple of paragraphs is that Beer is asking, asking is, if simple models are part of the problem of crisis, why do I have the right to tell you about a simple model of crisis? Mm-hmm. And the difference between like, so the the difference between the scientist and the fool is that the scientist is thro- they're both throwing away variety, but the scientist is doing so to to trim down to what he thinks is the invariance of the system under study, whereas the fool is simply a fool and is throwing it away for whatever foolish reason. Or you know, for the crisis manipulators are. So, like, the difference between Beer and Henry Kissinger is that, like, you know, they're both trying, they're both operating on relatively simple models. Kissinger is doing it for absolutely opportunistic and hateful reasons. Beer is trying to arrive at a, what hopefully is a set of invariants about crisis in general. And that's his, that's his, that's his, his excuse, basically, or his, 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 um, you know, his, his offer for why, why this is still relevant. And it's, it's our escape hatch out of, the kind of epistemic uh, tar pit of well, we we just can't know the details, yada yada, right? Like, and as like, well, every perspective is just as dumb as every other. No, there there is a virtue being posited there that like developing simple, relatively simple models that are tractable that identify in very truly invariant features of the system is a virtuous way of having a simple model uh, versus you know just having some horseshit model or having one that's highly motivated. Um, so I think that that's the sort of the warbush that he's going around there. Yeah, I think um, I'm uh, not sure what I think about Beer's philosophy of science here. Um, mm-hmm. I, I really don't know yet. I'd have to give it some more thought. Um, you know, 
excusing it by saying, well, it's submitted to the Papyrian criteria of disproof. Mm -hmm. It seems like, well... You have to get some Maka Potion there, you know? Okay, but... <laughs> <laughs> then you kind of yeah. run into like all of the typical problems of applying Papyrianism, especially mm -hmm. in social sciences, um, where it's like, oh yeah, you can't actually reliably do experiments, so how are you <laughs> going to disprove or prove something? Or sorry, disprove yeah, so. something is the, the only one that matters. Uh, so... Yeah, so bleh, I, I think that would probably need some more examination. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't really sign off 100% on that, even though, like, I get what he's trying to say with, like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for invariant principles just like a scientist would, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that is something that is distinct from... Uh, yeah, sort of pragmatic positional maneuvering uh, mm -hmm. for advantage. Uh, I have a lot of I have a lot of sympathy for Beer at this moment, right? Because I can kind of imagine him with the pen in the hand, and then pausing and going, "Fuck," because I've, I've just been writing this whole fucking book about this stuff, and then it turns out that maybe simple models are a problem. You know, this this sort of thing going around in his head. Um, and I think I, I appreciate yeah. his, his attempt at like <laughs> sure it away out, but like. It, it does seem to haunt him still, right? That, like, there is this kind of problem of, like, well, fuck, if, if there's just these hyper-complex crises and, you know, like, yeah, there's, there's, there's a real problem there. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the basic points that he's raised in the book about, like, you know, very complex systems and the need for variety attenuation in order to make anything tractable at all, operating in a universe of boundless complexity, um, are still very valid. Uh, there's really no getting around that. It's just a fact. Um, so what can we do with that is really the question. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm really grooving on uh, beer, beer, beer philosophy of, 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 of science here. Actually, I'm a, you know, maybe not like, you know, capital P popperianism, but I mean, yeah, like the basic idea of, you know, I have to verify ideas by experiment, see how well, you know, your models predict um, uh, the world. And, you know, and think of them in terms of their exportability. I, I, I think his uh, stressing, you know, like something has to be simple enough to actually be transmitted and coordinate, you know, multiple people, you know, like, th th I think that, that, that is, you know, um, uh, um, uh, central to what makes science different than like a person's personal expertise. Like, uh, uh, you know, like, like your personal skills that, you know, you might not even have words for versus, you know, um, uh, as, as Bogdanov um, uh, uh, would, would have said, you know, um, uh, um, models that help coordinate social labor. You know, like, and, you know, like, if, if that's what you're trying to do, you know, then you need something that can be transmitted across the social system. And so, yeah, well, like, uh, um, making your models with an eye toward that, I think, you know, as much as, like, uh, you know, there's some kind of hate toward reductionism in uh, some leftist adjacent circles, um, uh, uh, you know, like, the, I think that's just the only way to actually, you know, be effective in any way. Yeah, uh, I certainly agree that, uh, we do need reductionism in order to function. Uh, like, I think that aspect of the book that is raised is, is definitely valid. Uh, the thing that I am more skeptical about is uh, the application of Papyrianism here, because, again, how are you going to design experiments for those purposes? Uh, it's just a... It's just a, it's, it's just a very... Like you could you could use cybernetics to do small scale low complexity experiments and test your principles there with Papyrian methods, but again, it's like in social sciences, like experiment design is very difficult to do uh, if if it's possible at all, uh, and and I I mean it, it kind of gets to that sort of thing that Bureau was talking about where. Like, governments will use the media as a simulation uh, machine rather than actually enact a policy because the consequences are so vast, right? And so, like, just doing experiments 
uh, for the purposes of uh, like arriving at Papirian truths seems like it is something that is largely off the table. Um, uh, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, I guess we could gesture to the kind of good enough uh, modeling and planning that we saw in People's Republic of Walmart, like with Amazon, with its like model of associations between products that's just like dynamically generated by the apparent associations. And we'll never know if it's the true map of the territory, but shrug, who gives a shit? And it, it works well enough, you know? I think that's probably the best we're ever going to get. Yeah, like that's right. gesturing at a different philosophy of science than what mm -hmm. Hoover's talking about here, right? Like, Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I, I guess, I mean, for, for us, having moved on from Beer's position, that's the kind of thing we'd be, we'd be getting mm -hmm. rather than the Popperian um, experiment design. We would the, the best we could ever hope for is that the models never seem to be terribly wrong. And that's, that's, that's about as, val as, as much validation we'll ever get. Um, also, the, the, the notion of like the transmissibility of, of models and theories also kind of like suggests a kind of tantalizing thing that maybe maybe time cube is a true theory, but it's just impossible to transmit the whole thing in in, in full detail. And even if it was transmitted, it would be irrelevant anyway. Um, so maybe maybe total models of truth are are, uh, are actually baffling and, and impossible. Well, I mean, uh, the the book started by throwing those out the window, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Total models of truth are absolutely <laughs> not on the table. Uh, totally. uh, uh, Matt, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was, was going to say actually, but like, I, I, I think uh, uh, we're reading a little bit too much into like, uh, um, you know, his mention of Popper because I mean, like, beer was hardcore, like, in pretty much everything except like this paragraph into, you know, some version of anti-realism, you know, I mean, um, uh, 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 what, you know, what, uh, uh, what's it, um, you know, constructivism and instrumentalism and uh, even, you know, they, they even called it second order cybernetics that, you know, I mean, you're, you're not looking for the capital T truth. You're looking for, you know, good enough models like for a given purpose and, you know, with an understand and with even an eye like with constructivists and um, second order cybernetics, we even even with an eye towards something that kind of like is easy for humans to wrap their minds around. Like the whole reason like the VSM has five components is because, OK, you know, the, 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 that's like what you can keep track of. Like a human can keep track of like five things at once. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I'm just a bit disturbed that he he uh, sort of modded Bailey's to a very uh, almost like Platonist kind of uh, 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 model here. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, like if the the, the Republic will be Philip founded on invariant truths, uh, therefore it will be perfect because it's designed by philosophers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, blah blah blah. Uh, that that that's that's. I don't think that's the general thrust of Beer's approach. That uh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, uh, for record, I'm, uh, I, I think also um, uh, uh, the ways using invariant is maybe a little bit different than. Um, how, how you interpret it there? Like, uh, I don't think he means like invariant is in like yeah. Well, like like these are you know the wor the, the rules from the world of forms. I think it's just uh, regularities. You know, like there are invariants between two phenomena that you know uh, um, yeah that that uh, that you know that, that are consistent. Um, uh, uh, that you know like uh, whether you're throwing a, a rock or whether you're throwing a glass. You know, force seems to equal mass times acceleration. Like just that kind of thing. Not like yeah the, 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 these like eternal mathematical truths. Just you know things that are consistent between phenomena. Yeah, well, I think that is a valid hermeneutic move to read uh, this passage in the context of Beer's broader work. Um, I just uh, don't really agree with what this paragraph has to say uh, in itself. Um, so yeah, I, 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 yeah, I agree with the, the broader broader thrust of what's beer, what Beer is saying. Um, and I definitely recognize the amount of uh, stress he was under in writing this section as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, when we are in dire situations, it is uh, tempting to try to find some kind of certainty to latch onto. Um, so, uh, well, I think that does it for this section for uh, this week. Uh, we're, we're getting there, folks. Um, okay. Yeah. Making That's, good progress. Not, not too much further. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, see you next week for more. Uh, thanks for the discussion, as always. And, uh, yeah, take care. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.